Hi everyone, we're joined today by David Thompson and Trevor Benjamin, the award-winning designers of Undaunted Reinforcements, the hotly anticipated expansion to Undaunted Normandy and North Africa that is due out in September this year. Hi David, hi Trevor, thanks so much for being with us here at All Shucks this weekend. Yeah, thanks for having us. Hi, thanks. So I know that lots of people are really looking forward to reinforcements landing later this year, and I imagine that you guys are probably included in that number. So what I want to do uh, to kick us off is ask, what new aspects of reinforcements are you most excited about? Yeah, so for me, uh, the thing I'm most excited about is that, that reinforcements introduces four-player team play. So that's actually my very favorite way to play any board game is if it offers a team option, that's that's it. So um, even dating back when we first had the opportunity to um, add that to the expansion. So it's actually when when you all came to us and said, hey, we want an expansion for Normandy, North Africa. It's something that we actually presented as an option that we we felt really strongly about wanting to include. And I'm just excited to play it you know, for myself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm with you on that. Yeah, I totally agree. It's my favorite part too. Um, but another little thing that I really love about the game, it's a nerdy little detail, but um, in the the North Africa content, um, we've introduced mines and sappers. And um, yeah, I just really love the way they play. So they're, they're a lot of fun. This one's going to go back in time a little bit, but we wanted to know when you were originally designing Undaunted, did you have a sense of who you were designing it for? Yeah. Uh, so yes, the answer is yes. So there's there's sort of two two parts to that. One is I was just the, the idea was just something I wanted to explore, and the other was it was always sort of intended to be a homage to my grandfather. So I've I've told the story a little bit before, uh, Emily. I think you know the answer, but you know, the Undaunted Normandy is about the unit that my grandfather was part of. It's why I designed the game to begin with, and it's why that that unit was chosen. So it was always, you know, sort of dedicated to um, the research and um, just the work to to go into his memory and and the, the unit itself. So that was certainly on the theme side. Now on the gameplay side, it was more of an exploration of this idea of a tactical war game that had a spatial so board element, uh, but driven by deck building for all the command and control that you see in, in a, a war game. So one of the biggest differences between reinforcements and Normandy and North Africa is that reinforcements is an expansion to both of those games. So what were the challenges for you guys when designing it as an expansion rather than a standalone game? Um, I, well, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, I think, I think one of the biggest challenges whenever you're creating either an expansion or um, sort of a standalone expansion is that people expect it to be the same, has to be recognizable as what the first thing was, but it has to be different, right? I mean, there's no point in producing the exact same thing. So I think that's always the challenge with any expansion. Um, but I think the what makes an expansion um, probably the most difficult, at least for me personally, is that almost by definition it has to make the game more complicated right like you have to add bits you have to add details add mechanics and sort of my design preference and my style when i'm designing things is to strip everything out as much as possible and make it as simple as possible so this is like the, the an expansion is adding more chrome rather than removing bits um so i think that's probably the most difficult thing for me but on the other hand um, the benefit of a of an expansion is that you have context and you have constraints, right? Like you know what it is that people like about the game. You have a sense of what, you know, like you have all of this context to work in. So it's like, well, okay, this is what people like. I'll add more of that. Or, we'll, you know, we'll try to add things which take what you're familiar with and twist it up a little bit. So it's 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 exciting as well. Sure. Did you um, find that having the kind of two different games to kind of expand from, like what kind of challenges did that create? Yeah, that's that was that was interesting as well. Um, yeah, that's something that I've never had any experience with. So, um, I mean, really, it's two. You know, we treated it as sort of two mini expansions, right? For the for each of the two elements, but then we wanted to add some things which combine, which sort of pulled the two together, which is where the different play modes came in to so the four player and the solo play. Um, 
so that's what sort of unites it and and the and the just the sort of the thematic idea that these are you know reinforcements coming in to support you both in north africa and in normandy um but yeah I mean, in terms of the sort of mechanical bits it's i mean the games are quite i mean you know north africa and normandy have are, are have their own sort of little subsystems and worlds so we had to make stuff that fit into each of those of course of course uh in what ways do you think this expansion is going to challenge existing players those kind of veterans of undaunted yeah so uh, the the two obvious things is that it, it it is interesting introducing these new game modes right so right from the start people that are very familiar with normandy and north africa um they're not going to it's not just new content it's entirely new game modes so introducing that figuring out how, hey how do i coordinate with my partner in in the four player mode is going to be a big part of it um the solo mode i'm super super excited about and that will present a new challenge and it's been amazing to see like I'm, I'm a very big, um, I'm very active in the solo war game community, um, and so to see how Undaunted has been absolutely embraced already by that community without even an actual uh, official solo mode is is awesome. And so I think that that community is going to just gobble up what um, David Digby and David uh, Turksey have done with the solo mode. So. Uh, I think that's going to be a, another challenge in itself. Uh, the, the other thing that we wanted to mention was that um, we were able to use on the Normandy side, we we're able to introduce these sort of this concept of these new specialists, right? And so one thing people had asked us for for Normandy was a way to differentiate the forces between the Germans and the Americans, because in the original game, they're symmetric, even though they're, they might be different in the way you use them in each scenario, the actual full deck is symmetric. And so we've introduced these, these idea of specialists just to differentiate each of the sides. But what that also allows you to do is go back and replay all of those original Normandy scenarios with, with new units now. So setting aside Undaunted for a moment, and don't worry, we'll be back. I'd like to find out a bit more about how you got into gaming and in turn game design. So I guess the best place to start is at the beginning. Um, so the question I have for you is what game originally got you into the hobby? Um, okay, so yeah, I, my I think my story is unfortunately like many many other people's. Um, so I, you know, grew up playing games as a kid. Um, I was a bit of an omni gamer. Um, you know, played Dungeons and Dragons, tabletop games like Hero Quests, this sort of thing. Um, but I also played a lot of abstract games. I played a lot of chess and Go as a, as a, as when I was younger. Um, I played quite a bit of poker during my teenage years. Um, and then, and then, yeah, I then got back to the more standard things, played a lot of Magic the Gathering. That got me hooked. And then in terms of the sort of Euro game explosion, I, the most boring of all, I played, I discovered Settlers of Catan and that sort of just sucked me in. And then from there it was, um, you know, no looking back. Uh, so yeah, it's a pretty broad spectrum of games and even now i still play um sort of you know classical card games and abstract games as much as i do the the new hot hobby games so it's uh yeah pretty broad spectrum there you you really did tick them all right D, &D magic the gathering in Japan. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah yeah exactly um, so. <laughs> that's awesome um for me i i grew up on dungeons and dragons i played that basically from when i was a kid up until um about the time i would go to university uh and i was joined the air force i stopped playing um role-playing games when i got married and had kids and i started looking for something else that was like less time intensive and so that's when I discovered board games and transition. And so I'm relatively a latecomer to the board game hobby. So I've only been really into it for about eight or nine years. Uh, you guys have obviously designed together for a while, but what was the first game that you guys played together? Oh yeah, I, I yeah, that's a good question. I'm I, I know for certain that it was going to be some random prototype because um, we met. We met first at, as um, part of a, a, a larger sort of game design um, group. We have a, me a meetup group based in Cambridge in the UK. So I can't remember which game it was, but I'm sure it was just one of David's prototypes or someone else's. So it was probably a terrible game. Um, <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> but definitely, definitely my probably my most memorable play, like playing a proper published games experience with David was. Um, 
this was Essen two years ago, Essen, the big games convention in Germany. Um, so, you know, this is Essen where you have whatever, 1500 new games being released. And David brought with him in his backpack, we have I hadn't seen him in a year because he moved back to America by that point. Um, he brought in his backpack a copy of Blitzkrieg, um, which is, um, you know, the World War II in 15 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever it is. And we basically sat in a corner in the Essen Hall and played seven games back to back. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so it wasn't the first game we played, but it certainly, um, you know, after after having not seen him for a long time, it was the first game we played. Good. Um, so this next one uh, might put you on the spot a little bit, but I want to know if there's a game that you think out there that everybody should have in their collection. Obviously, excluding Undaunted, just for a moment. Oh, yeah, of course. that's right. Of course, yeah. of course. So uh, I have a. It's it, this is really tough, right? So if there's just one game, if there's just one game everybody should own, it's probably just one, right? And so I say that in jest, but I mean, it <laughs> it is it is that magical game that like transcends no matter what the situation, no matter what the group is, right? Hardcore gamers or families or whatever, you can play it on you know, Skype or whatever. So it's, or uh, Zoom. So it's, it's probably the one I would pick, but I often like to answer this question with like at player counts. And so I'm, you know, since we're talking to you all, I want to also give my pick for fit, best game to play with three players. And that's the King is dead. Right. That's so great. Great. I was so, 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 so happy to see the new edition come out. For one, because I've been trying to get a copy forever, and two, it's <laughs> gorgeous. So, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to cop out and say it depends on who the people are and, you know, what type of, like, you know, it, there's just too many. But but I'll just give a couple shout outs. So I, I think Just One's fantastic as well. Um, I mean, I play it all the time now. And um, another big one that I love is No Thanks. Um, incredibly simple game like that, that basically my answer is going to be pick games that you can play with anyone that's probably going to be the so so no thanks um i'm also huge as, as i mentioned huge fan of abstract games hey that's my fish is probably my favorite go-to abstract because it's got cute little penguin meeples um it's super simple like you can play it with a four-year-old five-year-old but it's also like got some meat to it and introduces you to a lot of the the wonderful things about abstract games so yeah so you've been designing games for quite a while now both separately and together and i was wondering if you had any sort of top bits of advice that you would give to an aspiring game designer <sighs> yeah um i would say if you are fortunate enough um and it's it's getting in the sort of this digital world, increasingly easier um, to find a community, right? Like game design is hard. So um, find some people to work with. Um, don't be scared to like share your ideas. Um, there are, you know, like just try to find a community, find a co-designer, try to find someone with more experience with you, someone smarter than you and um you know throw your ideas at them and try to work with them it's it's just infinitely better than trying to do it on your own i mean i appreciate that people are different and some people want to treat this as their own thing and that and that's fine but for me it's just yes i haven't tried to design a game on my own in many many years and i don't think i'd ever do it again i just i just think it's so much um more productive but also for me more interesting and meaningful to do it with with someone else so yeah do that go find someone smart one thing i would add to that too and i've seen this happening a lot lately is i'm so i'm right now i'm part of a um a group of people who are putting together something called the zenobia award which is it's specifically targeting like historical games war games and so we're we are specifically look targeting the the intent of the award is to increase diversity of game designers right but Putting that aside for a minute, the intent of the award, there are tons and tons and tons of opportunities right now for like w new game designers to to apply for these awards or to find mentorships or whatever. And so I would say, in addition to looking for potential co-designers, look for these types of opportunities to find a mentor because like there's just so much that 
so many parts of the design process that aren't just strictly game design. It's all the, the secondary stuff that a mentor can can help out with big time. I think um, you've touched on this a little bit, but that you know designers approach things in obviously very different ways. But I wondered if there was one thing, whether that be an object or an idea that has been essential to the way that you approach game design. So speaking for like us as a as a as a you know partnership, I think figuring out how we collaborate, right? And but I mean that in two ways. Um, part of it is like our personal relationship, how we personally collaborate with each other, and then part of it is the technical challenges of collaboration. And I know Trevor will probably touch on this some later. Um, so yeah, just speaking to that, right? Like our relationship, Trevor and I, we've been working together now for almost like I guess six years, right? And so yeah. Our relationship now is very, very, very different than what it was at the beginning. Um, and some of that was just figuring out strengths and weaknesses of each other and how we complement one another. And, but really, it just comes out to being like open and honest with each other about our thoughts and being able to have like that trusted environment where you can speak freely about what we think. So I think that's, I would say, the most essential thing about game design for, for us is having figured out how to collaborate effectively. 2020 and already the first few months of 2021 have presented unique challenges the way we live our lives, play our games, attend our conventions and, and do our jobs. So how have you found that COVID and lockdown have impacted the way that you approach game design? David and I live in different countries. Um, you know, now I'm in the UK, he's in America. And so for years we've been working almost exclusively um, remotely and, and digitally anyway. So in that way, it hasn't actually really changed it much at all. But certainly all the other things you mentioned, like, um, you know, not being able to go to conventions, like, like the, the way we interact with, um, with publishers is different now because, you know, t the, the, the sort of the old style of a convention comes, you know, you get your backpack, you throw all your new games in and set schedule wall to wall meetings for three days. I mean, that doesn't work anymore. So sort of transition away from that. And then obviously just trying to play test with broader test our games out with broader groups of people. Again, it's it's now it has to be um, digitally only. So that's um that's that's different you know we always had a, a did like the sort of the digital side and then we would eventually extend out to making prototypes and getting them in front of people on tables but we haven't been able to do that nearly as easily um so i think i think that's 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 probably the big one there um the board game industry is as we all know filled with some amazing and passionate people who are producing all kinds of content uh also interesting engaging content across a host of different platforms and I wondered if you could tell us a few of your go-to content creators in the industry right now. Yeah, I mean, it, for, for me, it, it kind of depends on what content I'm trying to consume, right? Like if I'm looking for a, a you know, how to play video, then it's it's obviously, you know, Watch It Played or, or Paul Grogan stuff. But um, my personal favorites would be, so my, my favorites, my dear friend, Liz Davidson, she runs um, a podcast called Beyond Solitaire. She's uh, a Dice Tower contributor um a reviewer and the thing i love most about her is is probably her podcast because although it's it's ostensibly tied to the game industry oftentimes the the cop topics are much deeper and much more meaningful and long lasting and so it's just a lot of depth there um which i really appreciate the other person i want to mention is candace harris who's with uh, board game geek and so at least for me, she seemed to like kind of burst out on the scene in the last couple of years and her reviews are just fantastic and I think eloquent and deep. And so I, I really appreciate what she's doing. So other than your own games, which game are you most excited about for 2021? So last year was the, um, the anniversary of women's suffrage in the US. And so there were two games that were announced. One was released was by Hollenspiel called um, The Vote. But this year, we'll see the release of a game called Votes for Women. Uh, it's by a new publisher called Fort Circle. So they had one game come out last year called um, Shores of Tripoli, which is a really good game. Um, but I'm super excited about Vote, Votes for Women. The gameplay, uh, it's like a, a card-driven game, which is one of my favorite uh, types of game. 
and the obviously the theme I'm super passionate about. So yeah, that's that's my number one. I totally forgot to mention. Like I should mention the designer of Boats for Women. So it's Tori Brown. Um, I think it might be her first design. And the artist is Bridget De and Delicata, who Trevor and I worked with mm. on War Chest. Uh, for me, it's um, a remake of uh, of a classic game. So um, I'm a massive fan of a game called Fjords. Um, it's by Franz Benno DeLonghi. Um, uh, and he, um, he passed away a few years ago. And he, um, but Grail Games is making a um, sort of a, a remake of this game. Um, with beautiful new art by um, Beth Sobel and um, some new gameplay content um, by Phil Walker Harding. And so, yeah, I'm really excited to get a copy of that. Finally, because um, I said we would definitely come back to, to reinforcements to Undaunted. And I know that loads of people are desperate to know this. So after reinforcements, what is next for Undaunted? There is no, there is no more undaunted. It's over. <laughs> no, that's that's not true, and I can tell you that for a fact because that's all that Trevor and I have worked on for the last year and a half. I feel like so. Yes. Um, yeah. It's we obviously we can't say what's next, right? What we can say is it's super super big. It's taken us a ton of time to work on. Yeah, it's um, a beast. It's a beast, and uh, <laughs> I can't. I mean, obviously we can't talk about the theme, right? But I can tell you that. The most commonly requested things for Undaunted by far are Pacific Theater and the um, Eastern Front or Stalingrad. So that's all we're going to say. Yeah. So <laughs> I, 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 yeah. Uh, no more? <laughs> I, I, I don't think we're allowed to say anything more. So. Uh, <laughs> okay. um, um, but yeah. We're also thinking even further down the line. So, um, you know, most of the core design work, well, the core design work for the next game is pretty much done. And so, yes, we are now thinking about reinforcements plus plus. Oh, so, wow. yeah. so we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Well, thank you so much for your time today, David and Trevor. It's been so interesting to talk to you both, and I can't wait for everyone to get their hands on reinforcements, get to the table, and find out why, just for themselves, why we're so excited about it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks a lot.